from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, it's a real treat to introduce this next speaker. Kadir Nelson is a multi-talented artist and author. Kadir started drawing at the age of three, and his trajectory since has been skyward with no sign of peaking. As an illustrator, he is known for his lively pictures in many, many children's books, including the tall tale Thunder Rose, which is a family favorite of ours, and the dance story Waiting in the Wings. He's applauded for the grace and skill with which he depicts the historical in books such as Henry's Freedom Box and Moses when Harriet Tubman led her people to freedom. But as an author as well as an illustrator, Kadir shines a light on important hidden pieces of history. We Are the Ship, the story of Negro League Baseball, highlights the proud and the shameful aspects of the national game. Kadir's newest book, Heart and Soul, gives us the sweep of the story of America and African Americans through the engaging voice of an elderly narrator. Kadir's books are scrupulously researched, carefully written, and accurately depicted. They are a gift for young people and for the adults in their lives. These books have garnered numerous awards, including the Caldecott Honor twice, the NAACP Image Award, the Coretta Scott King Award, and the Siebert Informational Book Award. In a starred review, Publishers Weekly recently praised his newest book, Heart and Soul, as a tremendous achievement. Join me in welcoming Kadir Nelson, the author and artist behind these tremendous books. Thank you. Okay, welcome, welcome. Uh, it's, it's a great treat to be here. I always love coming to this festival. And it's, can everyone hear me okay? No? Who said no? <laughs> well, it's, it's funny to me, life is funny because I stand before you today as, a, as an author and an, and an illustrator. And it's funny to me because as a little boy, I was one of those little kids who, who didn't like to read. Do we have any of those in here? A couple of them? Yeah. I know just how you feel. And it's funny because if you want to be an author, one of the prerequisites is that you have to read a lot. And it's, and it's also funny to me that I'm here because, as an author, is because I've been writing books about history. And history was not at all one of my favorite subjects in school. It was probably one of my least favorite school, uh, uh, classes in school. But the thing is, is that what I didn't realize was that history can be looked at as if it were a string of stories, and I loved to hear stories. I heard really great stories as a kid and as, adult, as an adult. I heard stories about, I heard one story about a woman who was born a slave and she was hit in the head as a little girl and she almost died and she, she came back to health. She ran away and decided to she ran up north and she just decided to come back south and, and free more of her people. I thought that was a really great story. I also heard a story about a very tall 
awkward man who was very awkward with women and, and awkward with, with uh, social, social situations, but he was, he was also a slow learner. But he ended up being very smart and often was the smartest person in the room, and he actually became the president of the United States, and some talk about him as being the best president, the greatest president that, that we ever had, and I thought that was a really great story. Um, one of the things that I really liked as a kid was listening to these really great stories. My father was a really great storyteller. And I remember as a kid not liking reading or not liking history. One of the reasons I didn't like it so much was because one of, I, I discovered in my classes that when it came to history about people that looked like me, it was often treated as if it were a sidebar to American history. And I, not seeing myself in a positive way, I think kind of discouraged me from looking at history as something that I might enjoy. A few years ago, I was commissioned to do a painting of Shirley Chisholm for the, uh, the House of Representatives. And, and going to the Capitol building, has anybody been to the Capitol building? Have you been to the rotunda inside there, inside the dome? Inside the rotunda, there are really great paintings. There's a lot of artwork in the Capitol building, an awful lot of artwork. And in the rotunda, there are a number of paintings, huge paintings, about the size of this, uh, this display here, this backdrop. Maybe even, I think they might be even a little bit larger. And there are about 10 or so of them in the Capitol rotunda. And they tell the story of the makings of America. And I, what I found very odd was that having known that throughout my career, I've been illustrating subjects that, have, that deal with slavery and the Underground Railroad, Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Great Migration, all the way to present day. So I, I learned that story, but the story that I knew was not being told in these paintings because there weren't any African American faces in any of the paintings, not one. There were plenty of Europeans and, and, and Native Americans, but no African Americans. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and as I said, you know, as, as I had painted works throughout my career that dealt with history, I learned a different story. And I wanted to learn even more about the American story. And I also wanted to learn how families like mine contributed to this, this grand experiment called America. And one of the ways that I did that was I started asking questions. I asked questions of my uh, I asked my, my mother about her experiences in the civil rights movement. I talked about my, I asked my grandmother who talked about her experiences. I would, and I, I would interview my family, mother, uncles, aunts, uh, extended family and friends to learn their stories. And I would ask, one of the first questions I would ask, I would ask, do you remember the last slave in your family? And one story came up my aunt Elaine had discovered this story of the last slave in our family. And I don't know his name, but the story was that, well, I'll, I'll actually back up a little bit. In our family, we, in, in the African-American tradition, there is this, uh, well, there's a tr tradition of having black eyed peas every New Year's Day. It's, this tradition is, uh, apparently it brings good luck for the new year. But I'd never heard of this story until I was good and grown. And I hadn't heard of it because we didn't practice that tradition in our family. And the reason we didn't practice was because of the story that I would later learn about the last labor in our family. And, and the, the story is that my however many greats grandfather had admonished all of his descendants and relatives from having or practicing that tradition of having the, the beans on New Year's Day. Because he remembered when he was a slave that every New Year's Day, pots of them were boiled and poured into a, a, a horse trough for all the slaves to eat like animals. And he hated it. He hated it so much that he said, no one in our family will allow any of us to treat us that way. So that one story made 
this part of American history much more meaningful to me, and it brought that part of our history alive. And I was hungry for more, so I asked questions about, uh, of, of people in my family and friends about their experiences. And they talked about the last slaves in their family, who they were, what their names were. They talked about uh, their experiences or memories of descendants who were in the Civil War and the Great World Wars, or uh, the underground, their experiences with uh, the Underground Railroad, all the way to present day. I heard really great stories. One was about, and it's, it's very small, but uh, my, one of my um, aunt's uh, aunts went to, to uh, listen to Martin Luther King speak in person. Now, it's one thing to read it in a, in a book, but it's another thing to hear someone's personal experience about what it was like to hear him speak. And she said something like, you know, just to hear his, you could see it, it was all in her body language, just to hear his voice, you know, it, it did something to you, it, it stirred your soul, it, it, and it also calmed you at the same time. And, and that small experience really brought that little moment alive for me. And I figured that I wanted, this was a story that I wanted to learn more of, and this is what the story that I wanted to, to tell through the work that I do. Now I said that it's, it's funny that I, I started, uh, that I became an author and then I became an author of history, but it's not so funny because at the same, at the same time I was learning, that I was working on these paintings, I was learning about these different subjects. And it was a really, really great way to, to bring it alive for me. And I, I did discover that history is a string of stories. I mean, in the word history is the word story. But I, wanted, I didn't want to learn his story. I wanted to learn my story and share that story with young readers. Now, when I finished, the first book that, I've ever, that I'd written and had published was a book called We Are the Ship, The Story of Negro League Baseball. Um, when I did that book, I didn't intend to write the book. I am an artist by trade, and I became an author by necessity. Uh, and the, the reason I wrote that book was because when I signed the book up and I was talking to my editor, she asked me who I wanted to write it because I knew, I knew I wasn't going to write it because I wasn't a writer. I hadn't written anything since college. And I had only learned how to write because of my 10th grade English teacher. Her name is Miss Visconti. And Miss Visconti was what some of her students, what some of her students thought she was mean. I didn't think she was mean. I just thought she was a stickler for quality. And when I went to her class, she said, well, she gave us all an assignment. Before that, I had been in basic English classes, and I'd gotten away with writing uh, works that weren't really up to par, and I would get a B, and that was fine with me. But when I was confronted with this, it was an advanced English class with Miss Visconti, that wouldn't do. So what she did is she gave us an assignment to write an essay. Now, I didn't really know how to write an essay. I just thought it was a bunch of words, so I just gave her what I'd given my other teachers, a minimal effort, a, a mediocre effort, and I turned it in. And then she returned it to me the next day, and she didn't even give me a grade. It said, not an essay, <laughs> and big, roll, uh, big bold red letters. And that kind of hurt my feelings. You know, I was looking for my B, and I didn't even get a grade. So I wanted to do well in her class, and I, and, and I realized that it, I'm the kind of person that often will need a push to, to, uh, to do something better than I had done before. So I, I went to Ms. Viscani and asked her if she could teach me to write a, a proper essay, which she did. And I'm grateful to Ms. Visconti because I used that skill to do well in her class and my classes until senior all the way th through college. And it wasn't until, and I actually got a B in her class. I got a B. So I did get my B. Um, so then I, I, I graduated, uh, went to college, graduated, and then I started to have to find work. And it wasn't, a, and I started doing children's books not long after that. And I remember when my editor 
asked me who I wanted to write the book, I gave her a long list of names of really great, really great writers. I had, you know, really high hopes. And she said, you know, this is a really great list. However, it might be a while before you can get on their calendar should they decide to write this book. So not being someone who wanted to wait, I said, in a moment of inspiration, I said, well, can I write it? And she said, sure. And I was stunned. You know, I was pleased. And I was also petrified, because now I'd gotten myself into a really fine mess. But I remembered hearing a really great writer, Nikki Giovanni, say once that. She said, you know, there's no such thing as, a, as writer's block. There's only a lack of information. So I made sure to get enough information so that I could tell this story in a confident way. And I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to just, what, I'll back up. The, thing, the other thing that was difficult about this long list of writers, of really great writers, I mean, as an illustrator or an artist, it wasn't my place to tell an, uh, an author how to write a book or, or what to write. So it, it made sense that I would write it myself. But you know, I'd gotten myself into a, a pretty deep hole, so I set about f getting enough information. And I was able to write the book. And you know, since I'm an, auth an artist by trade and an author second by necessity, writing is, was not very easy. It didn't come very easy to me. So I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. I'm writing about this part of Negro League history, that part of Negro League history, just writing all over the place. I mean, I was reading tons of books. But it wasn't until I remember this moment when a light went off, when I was sitting in my, my very comfortable chair that my uncle gave me, and I heard this voice. And the voice said, seems like we've been playing baseball for a mighty long time. And it was, it was like a great gong had gone off. I was like, that's the voice. And after that, I heard that, it was very easy to write that book. It pretty much wrote itself. And since I had such a really great experience with that one, and it, and it, was, it seemed like it was very easy to write that book, when I decided to, to work on this book, Heart and Soul, I thought it's going to be even easier. But boy, was I wrong. It wasn't, it wasn't very easy. I, was, I thought that I'd have this feather in my cap when I can just write this thing. And I, I started off writing this American history. And it, uh, it was awful. It was really awful. I did two drafts, and both drafts were terrible. And I shared them with my editor, and she said, keep writing, keep writing. <laughs> But I only had one more shot. So I talked to a friend of mine. His name is Sinke Henderson. And he, he's a writer. And he looked at my manuscript. He didn't even read the whole thing. He, he spotted it right on. He said, you're, not, you're trying to do something that, that you shouldn't be doing. You should tell the story that you, that you know that you can tell. And what he was telling me was that to cut all of that stuff out and just tell the truth. And that's what I did. And it was motivated by a fear, but it was, it was good. Sometimes fear is good. So I took all that stuff out. I was trying to write like I was, you know, Mark Twain or T.S. Eliot or something. And I'm not any, either of those guys. So I just took all that stuff out. And then, you know, one of the things that I do when I work on a book or any project is that the project, the book, or the painting, or whatever it is, it has to start from a loving place. It has to begin with love. Something that I love, someone that I love. And I always, I always, it's funny, you can go around in circles and circles, but you always have to come home. So that's what I did. I went home and I, and I thought about my grandmother, who I love to pieces. And I, when I listen to my grandmother speak, she has a rhythm to the way she speaks. And my grandmother is strong. You know, she's 87 years old. I shouldn't be telling her business. She's 80-something years old, and she speaks the truth, and she's going to give it to you straight. And I wanted to, give that, I wanted to tell this story in a way that would give it to you straight. But also, my, mother, my grandmother's very sweet, but I also wanted to sweeten that up just a little bit. So I thought of my friend Debbie Allen, uh, the dancer and, and uh, choreographer. She wears a million hats. She's from Texas. She's from Houston, and she speaks with a bit of a Texas twang sometimes. 
and often she'll end, she puts honeys and childs on the end of every sentence, you know. So I thought that would be a really great way to sweeten up this, 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 uh, this story that sometimes packs a punch. Uh, it's kind of like a spoonful of sugar that helps the, spoon, the, the medicine go down. And then once I finally took all that stuff out and started writing from the, a truthful place, then it became much e easier. I took my, that story, that narrative that my aunt found about, about the black eyed peas. I took the story of uh, the, my family who had gone to listen to Martin Luther King speak, and I took the story of, of uh, I took the name from one of the last slaves in, in the family of, uh, of my aunt's aunt. His name was Pap. And I figured I could tell this. This is a big story. When I told my editor that I wanted to write a, the American story, I didn't really know what I was getting into. It was another fine mess that I found myself in. And I, and I said that I, it was going to be something of a companion to We Are the Ship in the style and the format. It's about 100 pages. So how do you tell the story of America in 100 pages? Um, and one, the device that I found was to tell it through this family whose family tree extends throughout history from the beginning of our country to present day. And I could frame, I could literally frame this huge story with the stories and recollections and the family photographs of this narr narrator. And what a great story it is. You know, these, uh, you have a, a number of people who escaped left one country and founded their own country. However, they're boasting freedom, and then they keep a large population of their, the citizens as slaves. And uh, it would become much to the, the struggle of this group who, of, of, of people who were enslaved. Their struggle for freedom would help define the struggle for freedom that would define freedom for all of us today. I thought that was a great story. And then this, I heard a story about a woman who was about 100 years old. I believe she was in Chicago. And she had waited all of her life to vote in this historic election in 2008. And I thought it was a really interesting story that this 100-year-old woman had made a march to the polls to vote, vote in an election that not only an African-American was, had a very good chance of reaching high office, but a woman also. And I thought that was a great story. Well, that's, a, that's a great story. You can't make that up. And this is the story that I wanted to tell. And it would be through this family we could tell this, that I could tell this story. It would be the narrator who is nameless, and you only get to see her face when she's a child. And the reason is that you see her from behind, and at the end, you see her hands. She's holding a, a, she's holding a, a button showing that, that she wrote it. And the reason you don't get to see her is, one, is because the story is more important. But also, she was one of those anonymous freedom fighters whose family and friends and peers, she's one of those people who we'll never know, we'll never hear about. But her struggle for, for freedom, to help define freedom for all of us, was just as important as all of those people who, made, who would make history. And this was a, a really great story. And, a, and a, I really enjoyed the journey of learning all these stories in my family and then painting the images that would help tell this story. Now you'll see, now, literally throughout the book, you'll find, well, I'll, I'll back up. You know, and, and these, these days, these highly advanced technological days of e-books and iPads and so forth, there's a bit of apprehension about uh, attention that people have, readers have, about losing the, the physical book, which is understandable. We all grew up with, with books and being able to hold a book and curl up with a book. And I thought that keeping this in mind, what I really like to do, especially when it comes, I mean, I love the iPad just as much as anybody else. 
and I even read books. Don't tell anybody. I read books on the iPad, and I, and I really enjoy it. But when it comes to children's books, that's a different experience. And it's kind of like, you know, wanting to hold an old LP. You know, you kind of want to see the art big, you know, and I like to paint big. When I started this book, when I did We Are the Ship, the paintings were big. And that book took about six, seven years to do. Paintings were really big, seven feet, eight feet wide, five feet by five feet. They were really big paintings. When I started this book, I thought I would do the same thing. I started off really big. But as my deadline approached, the paintings kept getting smaller and smaller until they're about this size. Um, but as I was saying, I, I really wanted readers to have to see this story in a way that you can't experience on an iPad or on a, on a computer screen. I wanted you to look at the book and want to run your hand over it like it's a, an old family album. That's why it looks like an old family album. I think of Heart and Soul as if it were the American family album. And you'll also see throughout the book there are images that um, actually literally show a frame of one of her photographs from her personal collection. This is, we, we, the story pretty much begins with her talking about her great grandfather, Pap. He was the last Africa-born slave in her family. And I thought of Pap as a little man-child which is why he looks like a grown man in a little boy's body. But then Pap grows up, and when he's old enough, during the Civil War, he runs away from his plantation and becomes a, a, a soldier in, for the Union Army. So I can tell the slavery story, and then I can also tell the, the story of the Civil War as it relates to her family. And throughout the book, you'll see more frames. There's even, let's see. And this is kind of a funny story in that I remember I went to speak at a, I forget where I was speaking, but my editor had asked me to expand this particular chapter on slavery or the Civil War, which meant I had to create another piece, another piece of artwork. And I thought, great, I have an approaching deadline and I have to do another painting and I don't know what it's going to be. And I was speaking at this college, and we were having a, a lunch. I was having a lunch with a bunch of business people, which, as an artist, it's not always the most fun thing in the world to do. It's a lot of chatting, small chat, and head nodding. And all the while, I'm trying to figure out, what am I going to think of to do this painting to expand this chapter? And then somehow, one of the women in this meeting started talking about quilts. I thought, another, the, the light went off. I can use a quilt as a frame, again, to tell this story. So now all of a sudden, this made, meeting actually became very interesting. And I'm very, you never know where your, your ideas are going to come from. So then I looked at old quilts, and then I made up this freedom quilt. And one of the things that I do, is in my work is that often the subject matter can be looked at, looked at as negative or grim, but I always want to add an element of spirit or spirit, spiritual hope. And the number seven is very auspicious. So I would use, I often use the, the number seven to, to, to add that to the painting. So here, there are seven birds, which means it's like spiritual freedom. So this, that's what the, spirit, the, the, the African American uh, people would experience at the end of slavery. And also, there's one on this, this boat, the slave ship. There are seven seagulls. So, uh, so even though it's very difficult for this group of people at this particular time in history, the spirit is always with them. And that's what I often try to do. You even see it in, there's a picture of, uh, of, Ab of, not Abraham Lincoln, of Harriet Tubman behind her. She had a lot of uh, 
faith. She moved by faith. She felt like she moved by spirit. And that's what I wanted to show by those, with those seven birds. Now, this book took about, took about three years to, to, um, to, to create, beginning to end. And as you had heard, I do quite a bit of research for, the, for the, not only the, the text, but the artwork. So often what I'll do is I do a lot of research for each painting. I'll find visual cues. Now, if you're doing a painting of, if I were to do a painting of, uh, of a slave ship from 1839, where do you look? Who has an idea? Where do you look to find a photograph of a slave ship? Library of Congress, that's very good. Now, we're in school. You're going to have to put your hands up. I want to call you out. Okay. Library of Congress, the library. Where else? Who has an another idea? Right here. What's that? The internet? I'll tell you, the Library of Congress has a really great website, a great photograph uh, collection that you can research on the internet. So that's very good. Where else? What else? So you guys are just breaking the rules. <laughs> Let's see, way back there. In the museum. Very good, very good. So I'll look at, I'll look at all of those sources. But if I'm creating a, an image of, say, this, this is a, let's see, where is she? There's an image of this woman who's sitting in a pile of cotton. Does this image exist anywhere? No, it doesn't. Not in this way. So what I'll have to do is I'll figure out what I want to draw. I'll draw it on my canvas. A lot of these are, all of these paintings are oil paintings on canvas. And then I'll, I'll have to find photographs that will tell me what this woman at this point in time, this year or era, what she would dress like. I have to find a picture of her dress, what she would wear in her head. I have to find pictures of cotton. Um, and then I'll have to find someone to pose for me for this, this painting, because I want to know what those folds look like at this time of day, when the light is shining at late, late in the afternoon. Um, and at least in, in, when it comes to the work that I do, uh, I'm often working on a moment's notice. So I'll have to often pose myself. Yeah, for that one. I pose myself for that one. You could imagine I'm in my neighborhood and you know, my wife's not home, and I need someone to pose for me. So I was like, OK, I'll just bite the bullet and do this one myself. So I got an old sheet and an old you know, shirt and rolled it up. And I went to my front yard. Yes, my front yard. <laughs> the sun was setting, perfect time of day. And I sit down and hit my camera and take the picture. Now, you can imagine this six-foot black man sitting in his suburban neighborhood in his front yard in a dress, <laughs> which um, those photographs have been burned. They're gone. But I, have to, I do that for just about every, every painting in the book because I want it to look uh, realistic. And that's not something that, that can be made up. So that is pretty much the journey I went through. I, you know, I did a ton of reading and I did a, a ton of research for my uh, a photograph of research for the paintings. And, and lo and behold, three years later, I, I met my deadline. And um, heart and soul is, is the result of that. So it was really, thank you, thank you. And I think that as, as a result of the, the, the fruits of the labor of creating this book, I was able to see the, the, the contributions that not only families like mine, but families like yours have contributed or made to, to, to contribute to this grand experience, this grand tapestry. It's like a square on that quilt that make up, makes up this grand tapestry of the United States of America that you, you and I uh, uh, love and live in to this day. Now we only have, we don't have a whole lot of time. We have a few minutes left, but I would really love to take any questions that you might have. And
And no gotcha questions. I know this is Washington, D.C., but we're not doing So you can, if you can, walk up to the mic, and, um, and we'll take your questions. Well, I saw your exhibit in Fayetteville, North Carolina, at the Cumberland County Library. Uh -huh. And um, I just want to ask you, you said I know you pose for yourself. But on the other hand, how do you go about getting your other subjects? That when you don't pose for yourself or take pictures, to, how do you go about getting other subjects? Well, the other books that I've illustrated that are not, see, in my studio, I have two setups. I have my drawing table and my easel. And I had been working on my drawing table for most of my books early in my career. But after years of working at my table like this, my neck was killing me. And I really wanted to do more of my easel paintings for my books. So um, I kind of, I've pretty much abandoned that. And the, the only reason I say that is because um, many of the books that I was working on before, I didn't need to use models because it was, I would draw it and it was really kind of like filling in the lines. It was very easy for me to, to imagine what it would look like. But when it comes to the paintings that I do on my easel on canvas, these are larger, more painterly paintings that look more realistic and I can't really fake that. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, Does to it? some extent you did. Almost. I want, <laughs> another thing I want to ask, I'm familiar with the book Dancing in the Wings. Uh -huh. And uh, did you do the same thing with your subjects? For example, the girl that represents the dancer, the one that went to the competition in mm -hmm. D.C.? Uh, no, I did not wear a tutu, if that's what you mean. Oh, yes. No. <laughs> no. That was done on my drawing table, so I didn't need okay. to. <laughs> OK, thank, thank you. you. There was one over here. How many books have you made by yourself? By myself, I have illustrated right. and written three books. This is the second. The next one will be a book on Nelson Mandela, which tells the, the life of um, his life from as much as you can in a picture book, about 40 pages. Okay, I'm a good drawer, and I need to know what type of things do I need to do now to become a good artist like you? Mm. That's, a, that's a good question. Well, you have to, you know, as an artist, you pretty much draw or paint what you love to paint, so continue to draw and paint what you love to paint. You have to do it a lot. You have to draw a lot. Draw every day. That's the only way you're going to get better at it. Whether you're really writing or reading <laughs> or jogging or blogging, whatever it is, you have to practice doing that so you can get better. So I would, I would say do that. And then also, if you can, look at one of the things I always did was I looked at the best of the best. Who's the best? Who are my favorite painters? Who are my favorite? people who draw, or whatever it is, and I would study them and then try to pattern myself after them. I want to be like this person, or I want to draw like that person, or I'll take from this person or take from that one. I like how he draws faces. I like how he draws hands. And then just study them. The best thing you can do is study it. Study what, you're, you're, um, what you want to be. Right here. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. As a senior citizen, I'm starting a new career of writing and illustrating my own books. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching you and listening to you, telling how long it takes to do this. And I know how much energy it takes to write and to illustrate your books. So I was wondering, when you're doing this and you're inspired, how do you know how many pictures you're going to do to illustrate the written word? Is there a limit? Does your editor tell you how many pictures you're going to do? Or do you do as many as you're inspired to do and then let them cut back from that? Well, most picture books are about 32 pages or 40 pages. So that means you're either going to be doing uh, half of that 16, if there's going to be words and text, about 16 spreads, full spreads, or you're going to be doing that many paintings that correspond to how many paintings are, or pages are in the book. So that's kind of a predetermined number that you're going to work with. And of course, you have to add in your you know, title page and front and back matter. But um, that's, that's the template that you're working with. So you have to be able to tell a story within that allotment of pages. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you said that history is not your favorite subject, but I wondered if after doing all this research for these books, you've come to love history more. Oh, I, well, I love history. I, I began to love history after I learned that it was, it was a string of stories, and really good stories. And you can, 
and it depends who's telling the story. So you can have a thousand different interpretations of the same story. So, and, and I love stories. It's one of the things I, I love more than anything. So uh, I do have a love, love for history. I don't consider myself an historian, but I do love history. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, this is your second book that you've written. Mm -hmm. Do you need, does a child, what is the age that a child what is the age bracket for your book? That's the first question. And do you need to read the first book before you read the second book, or are they just entities within themselves? Uh, well, the, when I do books like this and the other book about the Negro Leagues, I'm not really thinking about an age bracket. Um, I like I want this book to be for all ages, for children and adults. When I did. Uh, when I did We Are the Ship, the only thing I had to keep in mind was that children were going to be reading it. So I had to, I couldn't include a lot of the colorful language that baseball players use when they play baseball. Um, but other than that, I mean, you look at the artwork, it's not kids' the artwork. It's, it's very painterly, and it suits the subject matter. And the second one, you don't have to read, they're two entirely, well, not two entirely, different subjects, but one is they are books unto themselves. One is about the history of the Negro Baseball Leagues, and this is a book about uh, the history of America. Mm -hmm. um, because your paintings are so large, what is the process um, that you have to go to to get your um, paintings to the printed page? What is that process an illustrator has to go through? Mm -hmm. Well, the paintings, for my other books that were smaller, it was done on paper. So they, they used to use a process, and I believe they still do, of putting these paintings or drawings on a drum and spinning it and separating the color. But if they're too big for that, then they're shot digitally. So then that's actually better because you don't lose anything, any generation. You go straight, straight there. Hi, I'm a third grade teacher, and I spend a lot of time developing my students as authors and writers. What would you recommend that I do with them to get them beyond just doing the basic representations of their words in order to create more colorful illustrations? Words in order to, hmm. well, I, I wouldn't know how to answer that question other than um, when you're writing for a children's book where pictures have to accompany the text, you have to think in pictures and you have to there has to be some way often when children's book writers will write a book they'll have to start over again or, or change a lot because there's no way you can illustrate this particular you know group of words it's, it's too abstract or there's nothing interesting there so I guess it's a matter of trying to figure out what you can do interestingly in the text that will uh, stir the imagination of the author or artist, if it's not themselves, that will uh, complement the words. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you. You're welcome. I think about w w one quick one. Very short. Just was wondering if this l latest book is recorded, if, if you... Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It was, and believe it or not, uh, it's narrated by Debbie Allen. Oh, awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm over time. Hope you enjoyed it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.